Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. <coughs> then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptize, baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There are three realities about the kingdom of God that Jesus is addressing that form what are laws of the kingdom of God. Not rules about the kingdom of God that you and I have to choose whether or not to obey and when to obey them. We're talking laws, principles, by which the kingdom of God operates. And we could choose to resist them. <coughs> But there are consequences to resisting these laws, just as there are consequences to jumping off a roof. Look with me at the end of the passage. This is where it's very hard. We're going to look at verse 41, beginning in verse 41. It's difficult because Jesus, in his prophecy of what's going to happen in Jerusalem, is giving away the whole deal, everything he wants to say. But then we have to go through the story to understand what in the world he's talking about. And that always makes Jesus difficult. So we're going to start at the end, because it's here in the end of this passage. That the entire passage, I think, is illuminated. And I'm calling this first point. Jesus reveals that acceptance of the laws of the kingdom is how we become free. Look back at verse 41. When the ten heard about this, so we've already had Peter, um, James and John asking their question. We'll get back to them. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, most of us are aware that the Bible wasn't written in English. It was written originally in Greek. And the Greek of this passage is profoundly interesting. Now, every translation I looked at in English all said almost the same thing, including the one I just read to you. I don't know what yours says. Does yours say in verse 43, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Is that equivalent to the language you have in your text? That it seems to be a command? That Jesus seems to be commanding his disciples to seek to be the least? What's interesting in the Greek is that it's not a command. It does not say must. Now, the, it, this is obviously a difficult passage because we have a whole bunch of different Greek manuscripts of Mark and they disagree with one another. Some of them say this, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you is your servant. Others say, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. But not one says, must be. What's at stake in that? And I should say this, that the critical version of the Greek Bible that we use in translating our English translations prefers that future tense. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. The point here is that these are not imperatives for Jesus. He's not making these kinds of laws. 
What he's illuminating is one of these laws. In the kingdom, greatness is pulled down. In the kingdom, those who are great become servants. Therefore, in the kingdom, those who rise to the top are not great. You can't be great in the kingdom and not find yourself in a position of service. It's a law, but it's not a rule. So here we have in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them, the humans, when He first created male. I'll start in verse 27 so we know where we are. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The Jewish people took those to be rules. And so they tried to enforce them. And some of the ways they enforced them were that it was illegal to not be married in Judaism. This was the first of 613 commandments given to the Jewish people by the law of Moses. And so if God commands us to be fruitful and multiply, He must be commanding us to be married. But what is not understood by the Jewish people entirely, but begins to be illuminated by Jesus, is that this was a law of this order, not a law of that order. And we know this to be true, because have you ever had to command anybody to be fruitful and multiply in this world? <coughs> Fill the earth and subdue it. That's a passion for us too. We push and we push and we push. We're trying to populate Antarctica now, and they're taking applications to go to Mars. I mean, that's great. Why? But Genesis tells us, because God said, fill the earth and subdue it. You and I don't have a choice. We're driven by a law like gravity. And when God speaks those kind of laws, you and I are without choice. We could fight them, we could resist them, we could have other things that cause us to not fulfill them the way that we should. But in the end, it's a passionate drive that's almost in our DNA. And what did God say? Fill the earth and subdue it. I mean, here we are. We don't just come in. We change it everywhere we go. In the kingdom of God, something new is happening. Now, what we've been talking about is the, is the laws that God spoke into being at creation, of which all of us are pulled by them, like gravity pulls things to things with mass. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus is setting up a new set of laws. Not rules, laws. And that kingdom operates differently. It pulls differently. And when we begin to come into that kingdom, things are transformed. And things start to operate by a different set of principles. And we're not talking about physical laws so much as the laws that are governing the human heart. Jesus is not condemning His disciples for wanting to fulfill the passions of their heart. But He is warning them that if they resist the laws of the kingdom, they will do so at their own peril. So Jesus reveals that thriving and greatness in the kingdom of God, that true freedom means we have to understand the laws by which that realm operates, and we have to accept it and cooperate with it. So now we go back just a little bit to these disciples and the question that they ask of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, you're in Genesis, you want to turn back to Mark. This is verse 35 of Mark 10. So here's the question they ask, and what led Jesus to say that. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptiz baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now what we have James and John doing here, and this looks almost like a mirror image of something that happened earlier. 
in the gospel. You remember when Jesus prophesied he was going to die and the disciples had an argument in the wake of that prophecy. They said, "Who? which of us is going to be the greatest? We talked about that. And in the context of that conversation, I talked about this idea that sin is a self turned in on itself, a self self obsessed with itself. Being selfish is sin, but that's not to say that we are to be selfless. There is a distinction to be made between selfishness and personhood. And Jesus values that. And I think this passage helps us to see it. What the disciples are doing is they're asking for positions of significance. They realize Jesus is going to die. They might even realize that asking to be at his right or his left would mean their deaths too. They might even understand that. I think they do when he says, can you drink the cup or be baptized with what I'm baptized with? And they say, yes, we can. We know what we're getting into. We'll die too. They're looking to be significant in the kingdom. And Jesus does not decry that search for significance, but he needs to remind them that significance in the kingdom only happens in a particular way. And I think Dallas Willard helps us to understand this. This is from the book, The Divine Conspiracy. He writes, To be ordinary is to be only more of the same. The human being screams against this from its every pore. To be just another one of those is deadening agony for us. Indeed, it actually drives some people to their death. It was never God's intention for anyone. This is why everyone, from the smallest child to the oldest adult, naturally wants in some way to be extraordinary, outstanding, making a unique contribution, or if all else fails, wants to be thought so, if only for a brief time. The drive to significance that first appears as a vital need in the tiny child, and later as its clamorous desire for attention, is not egotism. Egotistical individuals, self-obsessed individuals, see everything through themselves. They are always the dominant figures in their own field of vision. Unlike egotism, the drive to significance is a simple extension of the creative impulse of God that gave us being. It's not filtered through self-consciousness any more than is our lunge to catch a package falling from someone's hand. It is outwardly directed to the good to be done. We were built to count as water is made to run downhill. We are placed in a specific context to count in ways no one else does. That is our destiny. Our hunger for significance is a signal of who we are and why we're here. And it also is the basis of humanity's enduring response to Jesus. For he always takes individual human beings as seriously as their shredded dignity demands. And he has the resources to carry through with his high estimate of them. We were created to contribute, to be part of God's kingdom, to be significant individuals. And when Jesus calls each person to make a decision about him personally, he raises that personhood to a level. He values the person and your choices. But when a self-obsessed pers person seeks significance, the world burns. When a self-sacrificed person seeks significance, the kingdom is built. If you try to use your allegiance to God to get yourself into the highest levels of authority, the gravity of the kingdom pulls great ones to the bottom. And so the higher you climb, the harder and further you will fall. And so now we ask, then how, what is the smoothest road to greatness? How can I be the kind of person God has created me to be? Well, that takes us back to the beginning of the passage, because Jesus is showing us the road to greatness in the kingdom. And it's very strange. Mark chapter 9, I mean chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. The disciples were astonished. Those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside, so for most people who were nervous, he didn't say anything at all. He took the twelve aside, and he told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise. That passivity of Jesus must have been disconcerting for his disciples. After talking about going up, Jesus doesn't 
Talk about a single, a single thing he's going to do that he has any control of. Talk about being counter-revolutionary, counter-messianic. Now, I've often been taught that what Jesus is, is describing here is called civil disobedience, non-violent resistance to tyranny. And I've been told that that's the way of Jesus. But what I was shocked at this week was that Jesus doesn't engage in any nonviolent resistance. He didn't organize a sit-in. He doesn't get a whole bunch of people to crowd around the Pharisees' houses and scream at them. Matter of fact, Jesus' way is so bizarre. He's going to go up there, let them do whatever they want to him. That's his solution. This is the way of Jesus. If, if I had to give it any phrase, I would say it's active non-resistance. It's a desire to go right into the thick of trouble, Jerusalem, keep saying all the things that made everybody mad, and then let them do whatever they want to him. But Jesus indicates that this is greatness in the kingdom of God. And it has three characteristics that I just want to run through quickly. It has to recognize where the danger is. Secondly, it has to go right into the thick of that danger and expose it. And then third, it has to give up and let them do whatever they want. And through that, he's going to overthrow Rome. He's going to be the Messiah. There's something about humanity that if we don't appreciate Genesis, we will never fully understand the motivations that are at work in our hearts. We all started as nothing. And what Genesis says is that a creative force, unlike any in known reality, God himself spoke into that nothingness, and you, along with everything else, over however much time, popped out. But there's something in all of us that wants to be where we started. Nothing. And we think oftentimes we're fighting to live, but the truth is we're fighting to die. And there's a voice in us that wants us to return to our natural state. You want to go to disorder, to nothingness, to chaos. It's in you. It's in children. It's in adults. But the voice of God keeps speaking into that saying, come out, live, be organized, be permanent. And Jesus says to us, you have got to stop fighting me. This is gravity. And so when you and I feel conviction from the Holy Spirit, when we start to get nervous because of the sin we're doing, we have to re-understand what's happening. God is not saying to you, you're not good enough, you need to work harder. That's not what conviction is doing. What conviction is doing is showing you and I how we're resisting the natural state of the universe. You and I and our sin are constantly climbing higher and higher. It's the Tower of Babel all over again, where humanity wanted to build a tower to the heavens. That story still preaches, because you and I are still doing it. We're still trying to climb as high and as far as we can, but the gravity of God's creation will pull us to the floor, unless we start staying around down here and stop climbing. And that's what Jesus is more or less saying. Jesus is trying to tell us, folks, you don't have to fight so hard to live. I will make you live. Law tries to restrain evil, rules. But the laws of gravity dictate the way things will eventually work out. These are the laws of Jesus. He's trying to help us. And you have a choice to make. Do I want to be something? Or would I rather be the nothing from whence I came? In some ways I would argue that's why we're here. And so Jesus doesn't say to James and John, you guys shouldn't be looking to be important. Significance is a drive in the human heart. But he's saying, will you understand what is important and how to be great in my kingdom? And once we accept God's way, and we stop resisting and we stop following, it will lead folks to Jerusalem. And one day, whenever it is, it will end in our deaths. 
Jesus has transformed that road, which seems so terrifying that these folks were scared to death as they started it, into the only way to life. And he says, after you've suffered here for a little while, you will receive what has been promised. The kingdom of God will not protect us. The kingdom of God will not uplift us and make us powerful, rich, wealthy, or healthy necessarily. But the kingdom of God will lead us into a meaningful life in which we improve the body of which we are a part, that eventually will end in our deaths, but will result in our resurrection from the dead and our welcome into an eternity and an age in which there will no longer be a choice to make. It will have been made. And so my challenge to you today is twofold. If you are resisting God's move, will you stop? And if you are despairing God's power, will you trust 